Okay, so that's it for fuels. Now let's move on to moderators, which is fuels are interesting. You know, they they dictate a lot of this stuff, but moderators and coolants are where we start getting to a lot of the more like uh like the you know those like pamphlets where you got to pick the cable package and which kind of features you want. <laughs> it's a bit more like that with the the moderators and coolants here. But anyway, let's let's get to like a base level about it. So moderator material that slows neutrons efficiently. So again, neutrons from fission are very fast. Uh, the 14,000 kilometers per second I gave earlier was on, on a per second basis, on a per hour basis, 50 million kilometers per hour, 30 million miles per hour. Insane speeds. And yeah, it's easier to split fissile atoms with slow neutrons, so you can use lower enrichment, so that's why we use moderators. Moderating is uh, when, so when a neutron collides with an atom, it loses some energy. We call this scattering. I was trying to think the other day of like a, a simpler word to use than scattering, but it really, it's really hard to think of another analog. So colliding with an atom and losing energy is called scattering. Or rather just colliding with an atom. Uh, so to slow a neutron, you just have it hit a lot of atoms. Now, not just any atoms, so it's important to note that neutrons will lose a lot more energy per collision with a light element. I may have touched on that earlier with the periodic table. Uh, so think of like playing billiards or pool when those those two balls, like the billiard ball and the, the ball you're hitting are both, or the cue ball rather, and the and the, the numbered ball you're hitting are both the same size and weight, so they, they tend to transfer energy easily and like slow down a lot when they hit each other. But it, instead, if you were to think of like a billiard ball hitting like a bowling ball or maybe like a tiny little like rubber, rubber bouncy ball hitting a bowling ball, it's just going to like bounce right back off and keep like almost all his energy. So you want the light elements, you want billiard balls, you want the, the neutron to hit something like a hydrogen because a hydrogen atom uh, nucleus primarily. That hydrogen nucleus is just a proton, which is effectively the same mass as a neutron. So you're going to lose a lot of energy when you hit that hydrogen. So that means that hydrogen's a good moderator. We'll get into that on the next slide, but just uh, just give a, an example there. So the three main important things from a, a nuclear perspective that are important about a moderator are how light is it, so lighter is better, how likely are neutrons to scatter with it, higher is better, more scattering is better, and absorption, how likely are neutrons to be absorbed by this isotope, lower absorption is better because an absorbed atom cannot fission an atom. All right, so if, if you combine all those metrics together, the atomic weight scattering and absorption, you get a new metric called moderating ratio. So this gives you like one number that kind of gives you a, a solid gauge as to uh, how good a material will be at moderating. And this is purely from a nuclear perspective. We'll get into this in a second, but there are other concerns, but this is about moderators, other concerns and properties about moderators that make them desirable or not, but purely from a nuclear perspective, excuse me, we have moderating ratio. All right, so this first row here, we got water, uh, it has an atomic weight of one because it just has a proton. And then the, uh, so talking, so that's the atomic weight part. Scattering will we'll represent here with the number of collisions to go from fast to slow. And just as a footnote to be proper, this is from 2 MeV to 1 EV, very technical, but just to uh, just to cover the bases there. Uh, so this for water here, it takes about 16 collisions to go from fast to slow, which may sound like a lot, but if you look at these other materials, that is that is very low. It's about it is as low as you can get, pretty much. Neutron absorption, medium low, not great, not terrible. Uh, that gives you a moderating moderating ratio of 71 for water. We move on to heavy water here, you can see atomic weight twice because it has proton and neutron. Uh, it's worth noting that, you know, water, heavy water, they're chemical bonds there. Uh, the calculation for atomic weight is only using the hydrogen. It's a bit more complicated than that, but we'll leave it at that for simplicity's sake. So, you know, doubling the atomic weight almost doubles the number of collisions from fast to slow. And uh, heavy water is a very low neutron absorption. So very very low propensity to absorb neutrons the lowest in fact amongst all the moderators and that gives you a whopping moderating ratio of 5600 compared to 71 for water so 
Heavy water, very good moderator. Beryllium, another moderator possibility. Atomic weight nine, so a good bit heavier than our water water moderators. Few more collisions from fast to slow. Pretty low neutron absorption, good moderating ratio, about double of water. Graphite, yes, the old graphite. Graphite's a good moderator. Uh, don't let Chernobyl give you bad perceptions about graphite necessarily, but graphite has some tricky concerns. We'll get into in a bit. Atomic weight 12, number of collisions, fats are slow, a bit, bit higher still, pretty low neutron absorption. Good moderation, good moderating ratio, better than beryllium, second best here. Second best probably of all moderators. And then uh, just as an example here, let's look at uranium-238, uh, just to show how bad of a moderator it is, atomic weight, 238. Number of collisions to get a neutron from fast to slow, 1,800. Neutron absorption, medium, the fertile material, it wants to, has a propensity to absorb some neutrons, turn into plutonium. And then that moderating ratio, 0 0.0092, so yeah, terrible. So if we go back up to this this note up here above the table, so there's there really are no moderators uh, heavier than carbon and graphite. That's pretty much the cutoff. There could be some other exotic materials between hydrogen and carbon that are that are decent moderators, but yeah, exotic. They start getting exotic. These are pretty much the four moderators you got. And beryllium in itself is is a bit exotic, so it's pretty much water, heavy water, graphite. All right, welcome to the real world of moderators. <laughs> yeah, so as I mentioned, there, there are other concerns about a moderator that will affect whether or not it's a good moderator. Not just, there's of course more than just the nuclear neutronic perspective. There's other perspectives. So will this moderator be liquid or solid in a reactor? Water will be liquid. Graphite will be solid. What does that mean? How common of a material is it? Water is very common. Graphite less so beryllium even less so is it corrosive and or dangerous for humans to handle does it become radioactive after being in a reactor how does it handle high temperatures and radiation both of which will be in a reactor and then experience how much has this moderator been used before when you're first starting out nuclear reactors you know 70 years ago that's nothing will have much experience but these days we now have we have a wealth of experience. We have plenty of experience with some of these moderators, like the waters and the graphites, uh, less so with the beryllium's. All right, so let's go through some of these moderators uh, that we identified earlier, step by step, and go over some pros and cons of them. So, light water. First up, light water, the classic neutron moderator, very uh, prolific. I don't know if prolific is the right word. It's used a lot. Many, many reactors in the world use light water. Has that good moderating ratio, not great. Uh, uses the height, lightest isotope possible, so you're not going to get better than hydrogen when it comes to a uh, number of collisions from fast to slow. Common, cheap, and easy to get. If uh, your reactor has a leak, the moderator goes away. You need the moderator to get a chain reaction. I'm not sure I've said that before this point. But uh, in, in reactors that use a moderator, you need the moderator to get a chain reaction. So if the moderator goes away, you can no longer have a chain reaction. So that's a, that is a passive safety feature for a liquid moderator. And then, of course, lots of experience using this moderator. Cons. Hydrogen 1 absorbs some neutrons. Not a lot, but it absorbs some. So this played into the Chernobyl accident. Could Chernobyl have used heavy water? Perhaps. Avoided some of that, maybe. Uh, and this is why uh, you, can, you can't have a reactor with natural graphite with water, with light water. Uh, oh, just to reiterate, it's light water because hydrogen one, which is light hydrogen. Uh, you can't have a... Re uh, so I say light water. It's not pure light water, but water that exists like this. This is basically light water. There's a tiny amount of heavy water in it, but it's basically light water. So light water slash just water. But yeah, you can't have a, uh, a reactor with natural graphite, or excuse me, natural graphite, natural uranium with light water. Light water absorbs too many neutrons to get natural graph, uh, natural, <laughs> did it again. Uh, wa water, normal water absorbs too many neutrons to get 
natural uranium a chain reaction. And that's why it does not have a great moderating ratio. Only a good one. Another con with water is that it tends to it turns into a gas relatively easily. So you gotta operate it under high pressure. About 100 to 200 atmospheres, 2,500 PSI or so. So very high pressures, which means you need very strong reactor structures and piping, which means expensive. But overall, a good choice for a moderator. Heavy water. This will be pretty similar to light water with some marked differences. So yeah, two atoms of hydrogen, two, one of oxygen. You know, I'm actually not sure if it's always two atoms of hydrogen. Of Hydrogen 2, or it can be one atom of hydrogen 2. Not sure. I think it's two atoms of hydrogen 2. Anyway, best moderating ratio. Uh, H2 is good at a good at moderating neutrons, you know, second best. Uh, we can get a chain reaction with natural uranium. If it leaks, the water goes away, just like light water, lots of experience. Uh, the problem with heavy water is it's very rare, so you got to concentrate it, which is analogous to enriching. Not as probably not as difficult as enriching, but it's still something you have to do. It's another process that needs to be involved in your fuel cycle there, and then just like light water, it becomes a gas at reactor temperature, so you need that thicker, heavier piping. And overall, a good choice. All right, so those are. We're moving out of the water phase, the pretty common materials, into beryllium here now. Uh, this can be solid or liquid beryllium, element four. Great moderating ratio. Okay, it's slowing down neutrons, but absorbs very few. Uh, it's, it can be solid or liquid at reactor temperatures, but you know it's not going to turn into a gas as easily as water uh, if it's in a liquid state. Um, more of like a metal kind of boiling temperature if you want to call it but yeah it can stay solid in a reactor as well so that means you don't need the high pressure the reason you need a high pressure for a water reactor is just because of the water that's really it so if your reactor does not have water you can be designed for much lower pressures like three atmosphere 50 psi much more reasonable so you get, all your piping structures can be a lot thinner a lot cheaper <laughs> cheaper always has a negative connotation perhaps we should say cost efficient uh, a major con of beryllium is that it's toxic to humans and this isn't really an accident a nuclear reactor accident concern this is just a general handling concern uh, if you have a solid beryllium moderator in your reactor uh, you know if you have a problem with your reactor the, that solid beryllium is not going to go away it's going to stay there that can be a problem that's not a design ending problem that doesn't rule out beryllium but it's something you gotta account for and then not a lot of experience with this with this moderator primarily because well probably not primarily one reason is because it's a controlled material that's used in nuclear bombs so that makes it hard to acquire the only usage i know of it it's been proposed for some advanced reactors uh bullet three there but bullet two the only instance i know of it actually being used in a reactor like what we'll call a production reactor that's all like use in the field was a liquid metal cooled 1970s soviet naval reactor alpha class submarine if that kind of thing interests you had a liquid metal beryllium moderated reactor overall not the best choice not great not terrible again world of engineering if you can justify it go for it but on paper might be other options that are better looking. All right, and the last of the moderators we'll talk about, graphite. Again, this is pretty much the cutoff point for moderators. So you're not really going to find any good moderators heavier than graphite, which is carbon. I don't know if I mentioned that, but graphite is just pure carbon in a different crystal structure, I believe. It's getting into the realm of chemistry, chemistry and material science. <clears throat> But yeah, it's a good moderator, good moderating ratio. Okay, it's slowing down neutrons, so you're going to need a bigger reactor. All else equal, absorbs very few neutrons, which you can get critical with natural uranium, like the graphite pile. Or Chicago pile. Did I call it graphite pile earlier? I meant to say Chicago pile. Pretty common. Uh, solid at reactor temperatures. I think carbon has one of the highest burning points, melting points, whatever you want to call it. So again, you can do the low pressure thing which is good, cheaper, 
good amount of experience with it. Uh, a con, got to you got to purify it. Has a uh, natural graphite has some uh, some neutron absorbing type stuff in it. And boron, I think. Uh, so you don't want that. You want to take that out. But that's a uh, something you got to do. Something to consider. Uh, like solid graphite, it'll be fixed in place in an accident in a reactor. So that can make your chain reaction continue. So something that needs to be addressed. And uh, yeah, I mentioned earlier, all else equal, all <clears throat> excuse me, all else equal, reactor must be bigger than water because it takes longer to slow down neutrons than something like water. But overall, a good choice. Okay, now we've talked about moderators. Now we can finally move into the last kind of like fundamental property of a reactor. We can go to coolants now. So just like a coolant in a car, you use it to remove heat from your hot fuel. But in a car, that's really just to cool off the engine. But here you want to do it to, well, now let's not get into thermodynamics right now. But <laughs> an engine for a car, it's generally more for removing heat from the engine. But here for a reactor, it's so you can uh, do some work with that heated fluid, make electricity. And coolants are going to be liquid or a gas. Uh, if you were to have a solid coolant, it's called a heat sink. Just kind of like got into thinking about heat sinks. It's like even if you're like if have a if even if your solid coolant is like a heat sink, like in like a computer or something, the coolant is still air. So I'm not sure that there really are ever solid coolants heat sinks for like reactors. There's always some kind of fluid coolant, so liquid or gas. And just like moderators, there's important characteristics here, but uh, there's unless your coolant is also a moderator, which is the case for water. There's there's no nuclear concerns here generally, so uh, nuclear concerns, nuclear properties you're worried about too much. It's really just from like a thermodynamic standpoint. So let's get into that. So thermal conductivity: how easily does heat transfer to the coolant? Thermal capacity: how much heat can the coolant hold? Melting and boiling temperatures. So the hotter you can get your coolant. Uh, the more efficient your reactor will be. This is some basic thermodynamics here. Um, but that's an issue for something like water. Can't get water too hot. Uh, Long-term stability at elevated temperatures. Will this coolant burn or decompose, gunk, gunk up the reactor at all? Chemical compatibility. Does this coolant interact with the metals of the reactor, weaken it, interact with the turbine fluid? which is really only kind of important for one or two coolants, but we'll get into that in a second. Pumping power. How thick or viscous is this coolant? The thicker it is, the more power you're going to need to pump it. Uh, will it become radioactive after being in a reactor? And how radioactive? And then how much experience has the industry had with this coolant? So like moderators, we'll start with water. This is, again, one of the most common coolants out there. And uh, the pro of this is that your coolant is also a moderator, so you don't need two separate moderators. You don't need a separate moderator and a coolant, so you kill two birds with one stone, so to speak. And this this all applies for both uh, light water and heavy water. But uh, it doesn't always have to be liquid water. It can also be gas water. Uh, heat capacity water is the highest heat capacity of all the coolants. I don't think it has the highest heat capacity of any material, but it's pretty darn close. It has a very high heat capacity, very high ability to hold heat. Light water, very abundant, lots of experience, and it's pretty relatively non-corrosive. Um, but water coolant is a moderator, so you can only use this in slow reactors, cannot use this in a fast reactor. A low thermal conductivity, water doesn't transfer heat too well compared to metal coolants, so you got to space your fuel elements further apart. Tends to make your reactor a bit bigger. Again, water boils at a low temperature, so you need a high pressure to keep it liquid. Perhaps that should not have been listed in the moderator section. That might be more relevant in the coolant section. But since it's both a moderator and a coolant, it's kind of hard to separate it, separate that out. So it's fine. But yeah, so since you can't get it at high as a temperature, lower thermal efficiency. And then heavy water, somewhat expensive, rare as a coolant. 
up next we got organics what the heck are organics you may be thinking think of like mineral oil or like vegetable oil not vegetable oil per se but oils like that vegetable oil would burn and gunk up but no mineral oil is uh what you should be thinking of here also like water also a moderator uh very high heat capacity like water pretty abundant and uh it'll remain liquid at to higher temperatures than water so you can get it a little more efficient a little more efficient on your electricity conversion again it's a moderator slow reactors only yeah so organics oils have a lot of hydrogen and carbon in them so they're moderators low thermal conductivity like water you gotta space your fuel apart uh these organics tend to break down at high temperatures high radiation so again higher temperatures but lower efficiency than other coolants we'll talk about here and not a lot of experience with this coolant so i don't know i'm not sure how feasible organics are as a coolant and then there's a little picture over here just got a picture of like a refinery oil refinery kind of thing up next we got liquid metals liquid metals are in fact a coolant and this is a this is going to be in, in your realm of mostly fast reactors but thermal reactors can use liquid metal coolants as well with a fixed fixed moderator um instead of having different slides for a bunch of different liquid metal coolants we're just going to kind of address it all here i apologize if it's a bit text is a bit tiny overall pros high thermal conductivity so uh heat transfers to metal a lot more efficiently than water so you can put your fuel rods really close together won't boil so you can have your thinner reactor structures and get your coolant really hot so you can get some high efficiency here and then yeah i can use it for fast or slow reactors overall cons some of these coolants have high melting temperatures so if you're shutting down your reactor to do some maintenance uh the coolant freezing is a potential issue uh something i feel like you could easily account for you know put some kind of heaters in the in the piping structure but it's something you have to be worried about be concerned about spend energy and time and money on all right so for the sodium for the uh the liquid metals let's start with sodium here uh very low melting temperature so that's good for maintenance it's near like human body temperature so be pretty easy to keep that uh, liquid on reactor shutdown big con here <laughs> sodium tends to explode when it touches water 20,000 pounds of highly dangerous metallic sodium head for destruction in Lake Lenore, Washington. The government surplus chemical ignites and explodes when wet. The alkali lake is devoid of fish and forms an admirable disposal spot. A 3,500-pound container of sodium hurtles into the lake and crashes through a foot of ice. As the water seeps in, smoke rises through a series of muffled explosions. Um, so with our, let's go back up to that PWR image from the very beginning of the slide here of the slide deck. So if this were a liquid sodium reactor and sodium was in this loop, we would have to put, we could not have this primary sodium loop touch the turbine loop here. And just to be clear, this turbine loop is pretty much always water. It can be gas, but it's, it's going to be water. You're not going to have liquid metal in the turbine. It's just this, uh, just the reactor loop that has the liquid metal. So you would not have this sodium in this primary coolant loop hitting, or not hitting. Uh, you would not have this interfacing with the the water in the the turbine loop. And just to be clear, these are isolated from each other. The the heat just transfers between pipes. They don't actually mix. But uh, yeah, so the sodium would get a little radioactive after being in this. Uh, going through the reactor so you would not want radioactive sodium to hit water and explode so to deal with that you would put this radioactive sodium loop would interface with a non-radioactive so sodium loop that would then interface with the turbine loop so you have to put another loop of sodium in there and that just introduces inefficiency every time you got to transfer between loops you you lose efficiency in thermodynamics So that's a uh, that's a con for sodium, and then uh, disposal can be tricky. Disposal of the chemical by the War Assets Administration is made necessary because no public carrier will accept it for transportation to a purchaser. Next up, we got lead bismuth. 
This is pretty exotic. Uh, yeah, liquid lead with some bismuth in there. Uh, the bismuth lowers the melting temperature, I think. But yeah, that's some material science stuff. Um, so yeah, high melting temperature, difficult maintenance. Got to keep the, the coolant uh, liquid or figure out some way to melt it when you're going to start the reactor back up. Can't just turn the reactor on with the, the coolant frozen in the pipes. It's not going to... Well, maybe it can, but yeah. It's, 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 it's something you have to concern yourself with and spend some time and energy on figuring out. The U.S. does not use this, but Russia does. Or has. Uh, another liquid metal coolant, it's the combination of lithium, beryllium, and fluorine. This is from the molten salt reactor. This is a new advanced reactor type. Again, a lot of these advanced reactors that I say are new is because they're being considered again, but a lot of these designs were thought of initially, uh, like back in the 50s and 60s and such. So the designs are not necessarily new, but seriously implementing them is so what this is is you have your fuel lithium beryllium so beryllium is a moderator and your fluorine and they're all melted together so you have the fuel like melts in is melted into the coolant and the moderator is melted in it's all mixed together and it all flows through a loop together very uh exotic i'll say um so it goes through thin pipes thin pipes don't really let you get a chain reaction for uh, physics physics reasons, but uh, it, it collects together in like a big tank at one point, and then there it can become critical. A big tank lets you get critical there. So yeah, very interesting design on that front. And gases, we got gases as a coolant. Uh, major pro for this, it's already a gas. You don't have to worry about it boiling. You can get a pretty hot, high efficiency. And then uh, something I have not talked about at this point, I mentioned it, but not by name, is a loss of coolant accidents. So uh, if you lose your gas in a gas reactor, it's going to be replaced with another gas. So there's not much of a concern with cooling it, unlike a water reactor or liquid metal reactor where you're expecting that high heat capacity, high thermal conductivity coolant to be there to remove heat. When that goes away and you have to put gas in instead, gas is much less efficient thermal, thermal property-wise. So that can be an issue in those reactors. But for a gas-cooled reactor that's designed that way from the start, don't really have to worry about as much as a loss of coolant accident. Still something you got to account for and design for, but it's nowhere near as big of a concern as with the, uh, the water or metal reactors. So yeah, overall cons, low thermal properties, low specific... Well, it, uh, it may have a, a decent heat capacity on a per mass basis but you know gas is a lot less dense than a, a water or or a, a metal so the same amount of volume of gas is never going to hold as much heat as water or metal and then generally have lower thermal conductivities as well so your fuel tends to need to be much further spaced apart which we call low power density i think we'll get more into power density when we talk about reactors in a second here reactor designs so it's really only like three major gas coolants that are being considered. The best option is helium. It has the best thermal properties of any gas. Uh, not true. Hydrogen has the best thermal properties of any gas, but hydrogen has a tendency to blow up. Oh, the humanity! Oh, the humanity! <laughs> so, <laughs> we don't use hydrogen, uh, so helium is your next best option. And, uh, you know, the thermal properties aren't as good, but I think the, the pros of helium are much more worth it. Obviously, you know, hydrogen explodes, but other than that, helium is a noble gas, um, so it doesn't uh, inter interact or corrode things really at all. But it's expensive. It's rare. And then the other category of coolants is pretty much air or carbon dioxide. And just to be clear, carbon dioxide, like the greenhouse gas, you exhale that same carbon dioxide. Less the thermal properties than helium. Uh, CO2, rather inert. Air is not inert. Oxygen. So that can cor corrode reactor stuff. And then they're much more common and cheaper. So you want great thermal properties, but a bit more expensive or, or rare of a coolant, or are you willing to accept lesser thermal properties for a much more common, cheaper coolant? Mm -hmm.